Okay, let's just say I didn't make any plans to go cruising or posing in the Micra, all right? I mean, image-wise, for me, the Micra generally rests somewhere between tartan slippers and sweaters with animals on them. Personally, I've never really had the slightest interest in how well they actually go or stop, and that's for two simple reasons. Number one, I wouldn't be found dead in one, and number two, they're only ever driven by old people with straw hats and golf umbrellas velcroed onto the parcel shelf. But this one, I think, really is cute. It's the nose, it's sort of wrinkled. The nostrils, they're kind of a bit flary, really. It's cute, but not in a stuffed koala or some cloying, bug-eyed cartoon character kind of way. It's more like the cuteness of a puppy when it growls at you. It's got just a little bit of attitude. Nissan's designers have taken the previous Bambi look of the last Micra and they've armed it with a pop gun and a snarl. Now that, to me, really is cute. External changes are actually quite minimal. There's a completely new bonnet and a new grille at the front. The side strips with this broken line are new, not entirely sure about those. At each of the four corners there's one of these strips which do serve to visually widen the car and there's new rear tail lamps as well. But for our little fun sized cutester, it's under its little skinny winnie where most of the changes have taken place. And straight away this feels like a proper car in here. The dashboard is proper. There's no silly instrument pod sat up on top. It's all smoothly integrated. There's nothing tinny or tacky about it. It's really quite grown up as the interior of a car. The seats are comfortable. They're a bit firm, but not uncomfortable. There's only one problem, and that's with the driving position. There's no adjustment at all on the height of the driver's seat. And the adjustment of the steering wheel is very minimal and just for height, which means the very, very small people are going to have a bit of trouble getting very comfortable in here, which is quite ironic, really, in what is, after all, a very small car. The version before the version before this version of the Micra, if you remember the sort of squared off biscuit tin one, was so ghastly that subsequent generations of the car must have wondered how they could ever overcome the dreadfulness of their forebears. In fact, a couple of years or so ago, the newly redesigned Micra must have tripped merrily into the limelight, all cutesy curves and cheeky looks, only to discover that most of us were still reeling from the shock of their ancestors' tatty, shabby, tinny nastiness. And anyway, I didn't actually like the last car in its own right, even without its embarrassing family history. For me, it was just too cute, too cuddly, too noddy. For what is, after all, very much a city car, once you're out on the open road, it behaves itself reasonably well. The steering is actually quite sharp, but the brakes are a bit numb, they do let it down, and I must say that through the bends there is quite a lot of body roll. That's only if you push it, and I suppose, who's ever going to be too cruel to such a little cutie? It wouldn't be right. It also can start to feel a little bit cramped in the cabin, particularly when you think about what it's up against, the likes of Renault's Clio and a Volkswagen's Polo. And after a while, particularly in town, you do start to feel a little bit perched, a little bit on display. It all becomes, well, frankly, rather worryingly noddy land. Nissan say that they've simplified the usual complicated system of trim levels and options, and they've done this by offering three levels. So there's Equation, GX and SI. Everybody gets driver's airbag, body-coloured bumpers, tinted glass and a rear wipe. Then, features such as electric windows, a rear spoiler, remote control central locking become available later on as options on the GX and SI versions. So having chosen your trim level, you then choose your option from seven option packs, such as the City Pack, which gives power-assisted steering and central locking to the entry-level equation for £645. Or you might choose, for instance, the Audio Pack, that features a 10-disc CD auto changer for the £350, and so on. We're the Safety Pack, there's Air Conditioning Pack, Sports Pack and a Comfort Pack. Though I haven't yet found the Hooligan Pack, which would include V8 engine and luminous paint. Shame, really. But then it gets complicated again, because the SI is only available as a three-door. But you can get a GX and upgrade it with the sports pack, and that includes the SI trim. So that would be the SI alloy wheels, the rev counter, and basically you kind of build your own SI. So what's happened is, basically, you've ended up with a complicated system of trim levels and options, really. Just as a final point of interest, the NCVT, or Nissan Continuously Variable Transmission, is, if you like, a modern interpretation of the old Variomatic system. The ones with a series of funny cones and rubber bands that used to make your car feel a bit like driving a vacuum cleaner. Well, the good news is, the modern system works well. It's a stepless transmission, it puts the power down very effectively. But there is one downside, and that is, that if you floor it to move away from a standstill, the revs immediately rise to a peak. The rest of the car catches up with it in time, and it makes a noise not at all dissimilar to the tortuous clutch-burning starts favoured by the old people with the straw hats on the parcel shelf and the umbrella who used to buy the previous version of the Micra. 
Funny that, really, when you think about it. The big car seems suddenly to have become public enemy number one. If you drive a gorgeous beast that's packed with power and just oozes talk, then the envious looks you would have once received have been replaced by glares from the Green Brigade. And let's face it, the amount of money you spend filling the tank on one of these gas guzzlers could support a small third world country for a year. Nope, the powers that be seem determined to drive us into little cars with less power than a lawnmower. And every manufacturer worth its salt has jumped onto the bandwagon. Nissan didn't jump on the bandwagon, they really started the whole ball rolling. When they launched their small car, the Micra, in 1992, it was billed as a small car with a big car character. There was nothing else quite like it on the market, and it promptly waltzed off with a 1993 European Car of the Year award. Its lousy suspension forgiven because it looked so cute. But now, cute is everywhere, and Nissan have decided that it's time for the Micra to have a revamp. And all the tweaking seems to have worked. Micra 98 is much more fun to drive, but not as much fun as this version. We've approached uh, the range differently this time and we're offering a much wider choice. There are three basic models, uh, an entry level model, um, the GX, which is a, a comfort model, and the SI, which is a sporty model. Those three basic ones, you can then add various different packs of options. So you really can tailor the car to pretty much any way you want, including colour. There are ten colours to choose from, and you can have any one of those ten colours on any of the models in the range. Decisions, decisions. Now I have to choose for which of the three optional packs to go for. Should it be sporty with beefy bumpers and alloy wheels? Or maybe I'm more of a city girl. Maybe power steering and remote central locking is me. And once you've decided whether you're going to go for sporty or for comfort, it's the engine. The one litre or maybe the 1.3. Next, you need to decide if you want to zoom around in a manual or Nissan's version of the automatic, continually variable transmission, which for the first time in a car in its class can now be used in conjunction with ABS. It's all very well Nissan giving us absolutely heaps of choice, but if they're going to turn the Micra into more than just a cute little thing that appeals to women with young children or pensioners, then they're going to have to turn it into rather more of a driver's car. We felt we didn't need to change it completely. I think if you look at many other cars in the, in the market, in some way they've caught up. This, this round, quite friendly shape is a very popular thing. What we wanted to do was really broaden the appeal of it. Uh, it sold very well to women, particularly those with children, and to older people. Generally, men did not uh, warm to it. They felt it looked cute. And what we wanted to do was just make the car look a bit more assertive to, to broaden the appeal for it. Yeah, you say that you've, you didn't want to change it too much and that other people have caught up with you. Micro, when it first came out, was sort of revolutionary. It was very, very different. Yes. Do you not feel that maybe you should have tried to raise the stakes again this time? No, 
No, I think uh, small cars have a long life. Um, and they all last about 10 years and that's very much an industry norm. So for us it was, it was adapting and improving. Uh, there was never any question of sort of starting again. I don't think we think we needed to. It's, it's got a character. We wanted to build on it and really just broaden the appeal for the car. Well, there are some significant changes to the outside of the car. I think particularly at the front, um, you can see there's a new bonnet and a new grill. Um, and new headlamps that give it a much more assertive look on the road. We wanted to give it a bit more road presence. Um, also along the side there are some differences uh, with the, the trims and at the, and at the rear as well. The idea is not to change it radically because the Micra has a very strong identity and we need to keep that. We just want to improve it a little bit, give it more road presence. But the big changes or bigger changes are on the inside where there's a completely redesigned uh, interior, new dash, um, new seats and new materials that we think gives the car a real sort of big car feel uh, for a super mini. So we think people are going to really see the difference and, uh, and, and be appreciative of them. After the break, a look at the Micra's rival, the Renault Clio. What could be better? The glorious south of France on a beautiful spring day. The sun is shining, the sky is blue, and we're here in search of Nicole and Papa, well, particularly Nicole, from those dreadfully contrived TV commercials that are filmed around this area that have helped make the Renault Clio one of Europe's best sellers since its launch in 1981. Over four million Clios have been sold across Europe, and now it's time for an all new Clio. The Clio 2 from Renault. Now, when manufacturers decide that they want to change a car, they have a couple of options. Firstly, they go for a radical, completely different look, as Ford have done with the Escort's replacement, the Focus. Or they keep the name, they restyle, they improve features, as, say, Mazda have done with their new MX-5. Now, however, perhaps the designers at Renault have hit the middle ground with the new Clio. The name stays, obviously. It has a familiar look, yet it is all new. Now, if you've ever driven a Clio before, you'll already know how good it is. So the designers and engineers at Renault have had to work very hard to make the new Clio even better, and they succeeded with a whole new platform, a new body, and a new suspension. I really do like the shape of the new Clio. It's very chic, it's very French, it's very Renault, and I love the new rear. It has a huge rakish window, gorgeous styling, and big rear lights for increased safety. And the boot's not bad either for a car of this size. On three-door models, the front doors are big, which makes getting in and out of the back, even for a six-footer like me, reasonably comfortable, and quite roomy back there as well. Up front, it's an all-new fascia. Everything is easy and to hand and a useful display in the centre here on some models. So most importantly, what's the Clio actually like to drive on the open road? Well, not too bad. This is the 1.6 RXE I'm driving at the moment. 90 brake horsepower from that engine. Quite nippy, quite sprightly, although it does sound a bit harsh when you rev it hard. Handling is okay. There's a bit too much body roll though for my liking. It doesn't match up with the new Astra and the way that that handles. And the steering could do with being a little lighter, particularly at low speeds. Since, in other respects, the first-generation Clio was already positioned high in its segment, we created three essential positioning factors for the new Clio. We decided it must be better in terms of safety and reliability, better in terms of comfort and handling, and better in terms of actual specification, especially when it came to active and passive safety. Safety, as it should be, is high on the Clio's agenda. It's got twin airbags, certainly on some models, there are new pyrotechnic seatbelt pretensioners and new safety-type head restraints. The body is stiffer, and Renault say they've raised the stakes for small car safety by matching it to their largest vehicles. 
Now with any car, there are usually always some dislikes and niggles that you come across, and rather worryingly, I've come across quite a lot in the short space of time that I've had this Clio. The accelerator pedal is a bit sticky. The clutch has a very short travel, and you can even get your foot stuck down there. I haven't got big feet at all. Also, it's got air conditioning in this RXE, and to be honest, it's nothing short of useless. On a fairly warm day like today, 60 odd degrees, it just isn't blowing enough cool air into the cabin. And finally, the hazard warning button, hidden down here, almost underneath the handbrake, as if it had been forgotten and somebody said, my goodness, we forgot to put that button on, let's put it down there, out of the way. You'll find a Clio to suit your taste with three engines available, a 1.2 litre 60 brake horsepower, a 75 brake horsepower 1.4 litre, and the 1.6 litre which kicks out 90 brake horsepower. There'll be a diesel later this year and a 1.6 16-valve if you like your Renault spicy. The Clio is available in four trim levels from entry through RN, RT and Luxury RXE with a price range of £8,370 to £11,700 on the road and ABS is now standard on 50% of the range. Now there's no doubt that the Clio is in a very competitive market sector and the competition doesn't come much tougher than the Polo, the Fiesta, the Corsa and the Micra to name just a few. Renault predicts sales in 1999 of 60,000 for the Clio. Whether the UK will take it to heart quite as much as the outgoing model though remains to be seen. The 1.2 will certainly be the most popular version. And the Clio does have some niggly little items, but it should continue to be what Renault claim it is, a small car with big car refinement. We are talking about a very, very competitive end of the market here. The small car is very much hot property at the moment. And let's face it, when you look around, there's really not very much wrong with any of them. The manufacturers have pretty much got it sussed as far as the small car buyer is concerned. They've all got light, airy cabins. They've all got enough room in the boot for the shopping and enough room in the back to wedge in the kids or a couple of mates. Small economical engines all round. But you've got to choose according to something. Well, let's face it, no matter how hard-hearted, how ruthlessly efficient and logical we might claim to be when we're sat in the pub, at the end of the day, none of us wants to look a pillock. And when you're buying one of these small cars, the only thing you can choose by is how it looks. So how to choose? Well, for me, it comes down to the following. At one end, there's Fiat's diminutive Cinquecento, but Lycra's never really been me. There's Nissan's Micra, but then, on the outside it might look all new, but underneath there's no hiding it. We know it's still very much a case of tweed shirt, cloth cap and driving gloves. Ford's Fiesta, very popular indeed. Quite well made, very, very practical. Nice big pockets, waterproof even. I don't want to be seen in that. Also from Ford is the car. And then there's Volkswagen's Polo. Very smart, very practical, very well made. But somehow certainly not me. There's Rover's 100, which, um, yeah. Renault Clio, this is probably Nicole's own. Definitely not me, definitely not a chap's car, is it? Or is it? Because the new Clio, we're told, has been made very much more masculine. And if you ask me, I think they're right. This is Milton Keynes, and it is not the style capital of Europe. But that's precisely why we're here today. Because it's not the opinions of the boffins and the designers and the experts that we're interested in. Their opinion stops mattering the moment they sign the design off. And face it, not all of us spend much of our time swanning around Mayfair or the south of France. No, it's the people of Milton Keynes. It's their opinion that matters. It's the people of Milton Keynes who decide what's stylish and what's not stylish when they buy their cars. And that is why we have brought this, the new Clio, here today. Good shape too, but suspect the way it dips down at the back. Yeah, it definitely does but, come uh, down, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does come down off the roof, but uh, yeah, aerodynamically it looks good. How much? If I could afford it, I'd have it. <laughs> it just looks good, it looks different. Um, and the colour's really nice as well, it's an original colour. It looks slightly long on the wheelbase and it's got a very nice bum. <laughs> you like, but, well, no, some people have said it's got a big bum. But if you like big bums, that's, you know. Well, I like it because it's going to be, it's going to have a lot of room, easy um, to actually get stuff in. For chic. Chic. Mm, Has it got yeah. any Frenchness to it, do you think? Well, <laughs> I don't know. It probably does look a bit continental, doesn't it? Is that a good thing? Well, I should think so, yes. It... The way the top dips down a bit, it is nice. Do it like kinda, it. It sticks out a bit. Do you like that? It's a double bump, they've called it. It's got a big bump. <laughs> well, that'll suit me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd have it. 
it's not too bad. I think eventually all cars are going to look like that. But all the new cars these street. days seem to look very similar, don't like they? Buggy type and things. I don't really like the idea that it's geared specifically for women. You know. Well, Renault are actually saying this is a more masculine version of the really? previous Clear. And do you, do you think what it is? makes them think that it's more masculine then, do you know? Don't look at me, I don't oh. know. So I don't <laughs> like this. No, we don't like this idea that it's for men and it's for women. The car's yeah. got to be practical for what you use it for, regardless of what for you are. And if you're a man who takes the kids to school and a smaller car is easier to get around town, fine. Looks like there's more boot space. Is there, there is. Do you want to have a quick look? Are you the kind of person that cares about that, or do you like it to look good? Is that what matters? <laughs> no? See big boots? Yeah. No, it was, uh, I was looking to see if it's got a height adjustable. Oh, it has. Why well, is that important for you? Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah, I don't you see. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not slight, really it's a, an issue for me. Yeah. So we found out some of what the word on the street is about the design of the new Renault Clio. But to take the clothing analogy just a little further, we've come here to Nero's, a designer clothes shop, here in central Milton Keynes shopping centre. We're going to find out what an expert here thinks. When the clothes designing industry set out to design an item of clothing, it's got to fulfil a function, it's got a purpose. It has to do something, and it has to do that in a way that appeals to people's taste. So, we've spoken to some of the people who matter when a new car comes onto the market. Some of the people who might be buying a car like the new Clio. The people in Milton Keynes to find out their impressions of the design, the style and the look of the car. There is another group of people who are very important in this equation, of course, and they're the people who are going to sell them. So we're going to move from Milton Keynes, which still isn't the style capital of Europe, and move over to Dunstable, which isn't either. But there is a Renault dealer there, and we're going to talk to him and find out what he thinks of the car. He's been selling Renault for years, so of course he's been selling the previous version of the Clio. So it's going to be very interesting to find out what he thinks of the new one, because we mustn't forget, you and I might buy a car, and it's a big decision. We might be buying something like this, Nine and a half, ten thousand pounds. It's an awful lot of money. But for this guy that we're going to talk to, who's selling them, obviously he makes his living. So for him, it's crucial. How good is the car? How a customer's going to receive it? So this is Dunstable. This is Renault. We'll pull up and have a chat to the dealer, see what he thinks. It's actually quite odd to see the old Clio alongside the new. And it must be said, if you thought this was a bit close, just before we go in, look at this. If things do go a bit wrong for you in the supermarket crush, Plastic, very clever. Let's see what the dealer thinks. I think the car is still very, very fresh, but still retains some of the impact of the previous Clio, i.e. when you look at it, it's instantly recognisable from the front as a Clio, even though it was changed. And I don't think it will have the adverse effect of some of the new models being brought out in the last few years by some manufacturers, where you have a like it or loathe it situation. When we first saw the car in the press, I have to say I was a little bit disappointed like some pictures don't show it up to its best but when we went out to Paris to see the car in the flesh it was a revelation and the last time I can remember being that excited was if I can mention it when Nissan launched the new Micra